Praxis Prepper. Hey everybody, this is Praxis. Hey everybody, this is Praxis. At 5.30 tonight, I'm going to be releasing my regular video. It's kind of a practical DIY video about how you can prepare some sort of lesser-known grains that you might find in your pantry, you kind of different things you can do with them that, uh, you know, goes against sort of the standard approach of how you can prepare those as food. So that's going to be at 5.30. In this video, I want to talk about what everyone's talking about right now, which is the situation over in Eastern Europe. At the time of this recording, uh, shelling has allegedly already begun between some of the different groups in Ukraine, and I feel like it's only a matter of time before things just spiral more and more out of control over there. Uh, one of the viewers of this channel recently uh, drew my attention to a, a quote that I really like. It's from a comic book character from Joker, um, but I really like the quote, and it is, um, madness is, uh, yeah, madness is like gravity. All it takes is a little push. And insofar as war is madness, which I think makes a lot of sense. I mean, most of the time people are fighting over dirt or, you know, who's the correct god that's supposed to be living up in the sky or whatever. Uh, insofar as war is madness, all it does take is a little bit of a push, and we're seeing so many pushes happen right now. Um, I think that it's just a matter of time before things you know, get really awful over there. So, you know, what do we do about that? I, you know, most people aren't going to be in the direct line of fire. Unfortunately, there are plenty of people who are. There are people who could be watching this video, perhaps you right now. You're alive right now, and a week from now you won't be. It's so such a waste that people, uh, you know, fight over dirt in this way uh, to the point where people's lives are just torn apart. Um, but for the vast majority of us and the rest of the planet, uh, you know, that aren't in that uh, immediate area, um, you know, it's not going to be uh, a situation where we're directly impacted. But the indirect uh, impacts of this can be very dangerous as well for all of us. And I think the most likely uh, way in which this is going to kind of uh, reach out and touch all the rest of us in the uh, in the rest of the world is through cyber warfare. I think that that is the most likely route that this is going to be kind of uh, metastasizing out uh, to, to hit people. And what does that mean for you and for me? Well, it means uh, uh, a situation where a lot of the systems uh, that we are accustomed to uh, relying on uh, for our kind of functional lives to continue uh, it may go down. Uh, what does that mean? You know, uh, power grid, things like power grid uh, might go down, and power grid connects to pretty much everything else. If the power grid goes down, it impacts everything. I've had people uh, right here on this channel comment uh, more than once about how, uh, you know, I've done videos uh, in regard to uh, purifying water, storing water for an emergency situation. And uh, real people, I believe, at least I presume they're real people, have commented on numerous occasions that that is ridiculous because all you have to do is just turn on your tap and the water comes out. You know, it doesn't matter if you've lost power to your house because, you know, the water systems still work. And, uh, you know, these people clearly don't understand that you know the the pump stations also require energy in order to function um, so there are all sorts of impacts that could hit people and water is really a huge one uh, if you live in an area where you're dependent on the power grid to get water either because you have a well yourself or because you know obviously it's coming from pipes and it's being pumped from somewhere else and if their power goes down you may not be getting your water um, you know this is something that you should really think about now there's lots of ways of addressing uh, you know water access uh, during an emergency one of them is you know what you usually see people do before a hurricane they go out like crazy people they go to the uh, you know the local Walmart and they just fill their shopping cart full of bottles of water. Um, you know, that's, that's one approach to it. Um, but there are a lot of other approaches that are a lot more simple. Uh, if you're the kind of person that buys anything in a container, like uh, you know, soda pop or, or bottled juice or you know, really anything that comes in any kind of a vessel that can hold water, you're getting a lot of these free containers that you could put water in. Most people take those containers and they just throw them out, they recycle them or whatever. But these are incredibly valuable assets, um, especially if they are, get filled with water right now. So if you have like a juice container, Container and you finish up with it, rinse it out, put water in it, close it, put it in a cool dark place. Now that's not going to make it like shelf stable for you know years or whatever. You know you you, you would have to have some concern for you know the level of uh, safety of the water that's in there. But let's say you're in a situation where the power grid goes down, you lose access to water, and you know you've got that. Uh, you can purify that water a lot easier than you can purify water that you might get from other sources. If you hadn't set that aside and you know your plan is, well, I'll put tarps out and we'll get rain 
and the rain will fall into my tarp and I'll collect that. And you know, the birds will shit in the tarp too and some of that shit will get into the water. You know, yeah, you can filter that stuff, but how much longer is your filter uh, gonna last if you're filtering water that essentially just came out of your tap and it's just been sitting in a closet for a while versus trying to like filter bird shit and leaves and whatever out of, uh, out of your water. If you can set aside some water that's as clean as possible at this point, your filter's gonna last that much longer. Uh, there are all sorts of things that we are all reliant upon the system for. You know, here at my place, I built an entire house that uh, the intent is to make it as um, disconnectable from the system as possible. But even here at my house, uh, you know, it's not 100% at all. I'm still using grid electricity. We have solar pa uh, panels on the roof, but we haven't hooked them up yet. We have all the equipment to hook them up. I just haven't gotten around to it. Now, if we were in an extended blackout period and if there was no prospect for the grid turning back on, you can bet that that, uh, that would move up my priority list to hook up all that stuff and get it all running. Uh, but you know, I haven't done it yet, and uh, there are some big vulnerabilities that I've been uh, addressing over the past week here at our place. One of them is, like I said, we're still connected to the power grid, and if we ever had some kind of an, um, a, an energy surge from whatever source, an EMP or a coronal mass ejection from the sun or whatever, this house is still vulnerable to it, uh, at least until this morning. Uh, over the past week, I've uh, you know, gotten some surge uh, protection equipment and I've started hooking that up. So, uh, you know, even someone like myself who's been doing this for many years, and I, like I said, I built a whole house around the idea, there are still things that I need to do. And the process that I use to try to figure out what those things are is to think about what are all the things that I still kind of rely on the rest of the world for and try to figure out little workarounds for that. You know, it doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be uh, like, you know, if you're putting solar panels on your roof, you know, it doesn't have to be enough electricity that you could live your normal daily life on. You know, you know sure it'd be great if you could play your stereo 24 hours a day and play video games and do all the other things you love doing with electricity, but it, wouldn't it be great to just have at least enough electricity for kind of like the basics, you know, to have some lights on in your house, um, you know, to be able to, uh, you know, run circulation fans, or uh, you know, if you live in a place where you can get a lot of humidity and maybe like mold might be uh, building up, that you could run a dehumidifier, which is actually a fairly heavy load machine, uh, you know, running a dehumidifier, uh, you know. A lot of times people uh, get fixated on the perfect and uh, you know I hear uh, Brad over on Full Spectrum Survival uh, speak to this a lot where uh, he, uh, he has a lot of people that are very active on his channel and uh, according to Brad he gets a lot of comments uh, very similar to a lot of the comments that I get where people will say like it's ridiculous for you to do X, Y, or Z because you know A, B, or C could happen and it would negate you know some of those things. Um, and, the, and the solution to those people is you know you might as well do nothing. Uh, and it's just, it's really, I think it's more of a defense mechanism way of thinking. It's like, you know, laziness trying to kick in and come up with some sort of a, uh, uh, an excuse for being lazy, why it's sensible or logical to be lazy. But it's just, it's such a foolish idea. If you were in a situation where you, uh, you know, get knocked down to zero, uh, wouldn't it be better to have at least something versus nothing? Uh, you know, I with water access, you know, there are very, very few people in the Western world that have any idea what the idea of really being thirsty is. You know, we use the word, you know, oh, I'm thirsty, which for us means like, oh, maybe I haven't had a drink in, you know, a couple of hours or something like that, and I've been running around and sweating in the sun. That's, that's thirsty for us. Uh, that's not dying of thirst. It's, there are whole uh, different levels of, uh, you know, meaning between those two things. My personal closest uh, thing to uh, being thirsty was I was camping once, I was doing a hike, and um, we were hiking along for a day, and uh, we ran out of water. We were up in some kind of hill areas, and normally, uh, you know, my experience had been that if you hike for long enough, you're eventually gonna come by something. But we didn't come by anything, and, uh, you know, it's getting close to the evening time, and um, we didn't have any water. So uh, what I ended up doing is I, I figured uh, the trail was kind of heading in a downward direction. You know, there'll probably be something down at the bottom of this trail, even if it's just like, you know, some puddles or something like that, and I can filter some water out of it. So I kind of jogged up ahead. I don't know if jogging was the best idea. I went up, up about, you know, maybe like a half a mile or so, didn't find anything, and ended up kind of slowly walking back to camp. Um, you know, I uh, got back to camp, we just didn't have any water, and, uh, you know, that was it. You know, we went to bed, and then the next day we kind of went out, and, uh, you know, the next day we were able to find water. Uh, but that was just a matter of hours. Essentially, you know, towards the end of the day we ran out of water, and, uh, you know, sometime mid-morning the next day we were able to find some. Um, 
That is an incredibly mild experience compared to really running out of water. And um, you know, based on how my body felt then, I don't, I don't really want to know what it's like to not have any access to any water. So even if it's as simple as filling up some juice containers and having some water, if I was ever in a situation where I had no water, I know I would be thanking myself. So think about all those types of things, the things you need, the things you use every day, and uh, you know, secure those things now for yourself to the greatest degree that you can. It doesn't have to be perfect, but having some is better than having nothing. And hopefully we don't need any of it. I don't think that's the way things are looking, but you know, I always like to hope that people will, uh, you know, turn the corner on always fighting over dirt and, you know, what's the proper name and proper face of whatever God's supposed to live up in the, up in the sky up there. So tonight, 5.30, we're going to be talking about how to prepare uh, uh, the super grain of the future, actually. The super grain of the future. If you have any of this or any other grain in your pantry, grains, uh, uh, you can really cross-train grains and use them in lots of different ways. And tonight, we're going to be talking about kind of a different approach of how to use grains you might have in your pantry. That's it. Thanks for watching. This episode has been brought to you in part by Prescott Caliber Club and Jeske Defense Strategies. Prescott Caliber Club is a federally licensed firearm manufacturer and retail store specializing in firearms, survival gear, and producing great online content. If you want to thank them for supporting this channel, go check them out at prescottcalclub.com. Please subscribe and tune in every Friday at 4.30 New York time for a new video. And if you'd like to support this channel, you can do so both through Patreon or PayPal.